Fábio, oi Fábio. Oi, oh, YouTube. Ok. Boa, boa noite a todos. Bem-vindos a mais um SMCP virtual. Hoje vamos conversar sobre terapias atuais para o prolapso de reto, para o tratamento do prolapso de reto. E teremos a honra de contar com mais um expoente internacional, o doutor Marcos Ocali, da Universidade de Colômbia, em Nova York. A moderação será feita pelo doutor Antônio Lacerda Filho, presidente eleito da Sociedade Brasileira de Coloproctologia. Todos devem enviar suas perguntas em português ou em inglês, como quiserem, e elas serão repassadas ao palestrante. I would like to introduce you all, Dr. Zocali. But first and foremost, I would like to thank Dr. Zocali for accepting my invitation at this lecture. Dr. Zocali is a brilliant surgeon and excellent researcher. Work with him makes research smoother and makes surgeries look easy. Dr. Zocali is assistant professor of surgery in the vision of color and rectal surgery at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center. I'm sure we will learn a lot from him here today. And I'm so happy to welcome Dr. Marcos Zocali. Take it away, Dr. Zocali. Thank you very much for the uh, non-deserved introduction <laughs> and uh, a personal thank for the monumental work that you did with us. It was a pleasure working with you, even though we overlapped very briefly and then the pandemic kind of got in the way, but I hope that you will keep uh, working with us remotely if you have some time, because we have yes, one of them still unfinished. Will. And again, uh, thank you to the uh, society for the kind invitation. It's a real privilege for me. Um, if you would like, I have some slides to go by, uh, if it's okay for me to share my screen. Y yes. Also, if you see lights in the background, this, these are not special effects, it's just a bad storm going uh, through New York, uh, and that's a window. So oh, yeah? Yes, <laughs> don't be scared. Um, so the topic of my presentation is uh, centered on uh, rectal prolapse. Uh, I don't have anything groundbreaking to uh, share with you. Uh, what I try to do is mostly uh, put together a coherent approach to this problem and then provide some evidence uh, to support what we do these days and what I was trained to do. I'm pretty much fresh out of training. so. A lot of things I've learned very recently. When I started my fellowship, everything around pelvic floor was what I thought I would never want to deal with. It's not very appealing. Uh, uh, patients can be difficult. It's an interesting population. It can be very unsatisfying. Not a lot of these cases will turn into a procedure. However, once you start understanding this problem, first of all, you realize that you can make a deep impact into this patient's life. Uh, and also, it's a niche where you can build on, you can build an interesting practice, and uh, when indicated, you can do some pretty exciting surgery. Um, the talk is a little broad, it starts from very uh, generic concepts, and I'll take it uh, in a stepwise manner. So just so we speak all the same language, when we talk about rectal prolapse or procedentia, uh, we are referring to the extrusion of the full thickness of the rectum, meaning all the layers are coming out of the anus uh, through the anal canal and uh, they are visible beyond the anal verge. If the prolapse does not extend uh, past the anus, it's usually called either internal prolapse or rectal intussusception. When we talk about mucosal prolapse instead, uh, we refer to only the inner layer of the bowel, only the mucosa protruding externally. Um, the underlying uh, processes that uh, allow this to happen uh, and anatomical conditions that are, are observed concomitantly with the prolapse are a laxity of the rectal attachments, which uh, of course allow the rectum to slide outside of the body. Uh, it's commonly associated with a deep pouch of Douglas. Uh, the rectum is loosely fixed to the sacrum at that point, and the sigmoid colon is often uh, 
stretched out and redundant. Uh, the second condition seen most often in elderly women, uh, the average age is 70, and it's usually associated with other pelvic floor disorders. Um, until proven otherwise, this should be considered a, a multi-compartment process, uh, meaning that we need to assess also for vaginal prolapse and other conditions such as enterocele, cystocele, rectocele. Um, and uh, it's important to um, ask the patient if they have uh, other symptoms, uh, such as urinary incontinence that is very uh, commonly associated with prolapse. Um, it's most commonly seen in women. They are six uh, times more prone to develop prolapse than men. And when it's seen uh, in a male patient, it's usually associated with long-standing defec defecatory disorders, some form of dysmotility, or either psychiatric comorbidities, some eating disorders, or other uh, developmental issues. This is a common picture. Um, I don't know if there are uh, medical students or residents in the audience, but uh, for an expert uh, clinician, this is no mystery. But uh, for somebody who's just starting seeing this problem, uh, the prolapse, which is the one on the left, can, uh, to the inexperienced eye, look somewhat similar to uh, a hemorrhoidal prolapse. The difference is that, as you can see, when you see the concentric rings or the stuck coin appearance uh, of the bowel like that, that is a rectal prolapse. When they kind of protrude like lobules, that normally two or three, then it's a hemorrhoidal prolapse. And uh, when we look at it, sorry about that. When you look on a cross-sectional, you can see those uh, processes that we said are, are associated to the prolapse. So in cross-section, you see a very deep pouch of Douglas. Uh, you can see that the rectum is no longer attached uh, to the sacrum. The lateral stalks that here are not depicted, of course, are loose as well, and the colon is elongated. Uh, this classification, the Oxford, Oxford classification that has been developed kind of mostly uh, from an imaging standpoint to uh, for everybody to speak the same language, it doesn't really have any deep uh, treatment implication, but it, it helps understanding the degree of prolapse. It goes from grade one to five, Five is external prolapse, uh, meaning that you can see actually the bowel protruding through the anus. Uh, the grade one through four is actually referring to intussusception. Grade one and two um, are used uh, when uh, the prolapse is associated to um, uh, a rectocele. So if the prolapse just uh, goes above the rectocele as a grade one, if it goes beyond the rectocele and kind of pushing onto it as a grade two, and then grade three and four instead when uh, there is no rectocele and the prolapse is uh, instead graded based to its relationship to the anal sphincter. So if it reaches just the top of the anal canal, it's going to be a grade four. And if it gets into the anal canal, it's going to be um, a grade four. Again, not a whole lot of difference now we manage this, but it's helpful because, you know, it helps understand if you get a phone call from a radiologist, oh, I see a grade two, you at least know what they're talking about. Most patients will present either because they feel a bulge when they move their bowel. Um, most commonly, they will have some degree of uh, mucus drain drainage or they'll have accidents. Uh, we'll talk about incontinence and the mechanism associated with it. Uh, most patients will have constipation, which is uh, coexistent. They'll have this constant feeling or, or urge to defecate, feeling of pressure, pain, and bleeding because the prolapse in mucosa uh, will erode, and uh, it's common to see uh, an associated anterior uh, ulcer. Uh, incontinence is reported again in the majority of these patients, some degree at the very least. And uh, all these patients are supposed are uh, expected to have some degree of sphincter damage. This is caused by the chronic stretch. The prolapsing rectum will chronically stretch uh, the sphincter constant trauma determined by uh, either uh, straining and obviously the presence of the prolapse. Uh, the rectal anal uh, inhibitory reflex is constantly stimulated. The transition zone is masked. They have altered sensation. And ultimately, this will determine uh, sphincter dysfunction. Um, adding to that, it has been shown that in about half of this patient, uh, there is an actual uh, damage to the pudendal nerve. Um, Especially in women, this may be secondary to uh, 
childbirth trauma, um, or even, uh, again, prolonged straining over time and uh, uh, the bulging out of the pelvic floor will eventually determine some degree of dental neuropathy, which will reflect uh, in uh, further atrophy of the external sphincter muscle. Constipation is uh, present in almost half of this patient, um, and it comes in two flavors. It's either an associated motility issue, or it's a concept, it's an outlet type associated with pelvic floor dyssynergia, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. The patients are constipated, they keep straining, the bile enters a set more, and it creates some degree of obstruction, and then they have to strain more, and you see how this uh, problem perpetuates itself. We always recommend to evaluate this patient in uh, all position. Uh, sometimes uh, it will not possible to elicit the prolapse by having them uh, either in uh, uh, prone position or having them on the left lateral decubitus. So we uh, often in clinic, we have them strain on the commode and see if we can actually reproduce the prolapse. With modern technology, sometimes if we can see it in clinic, we ask them to take a picture when you see it at home. So we see what we're talking about. Of course, the constipation needs to be addressed, conservative measures needs to be attempted, and the bowel function needs to be optimized as much as possible. If they're not up to date with the screening colonoscopy, obviously recommend a colonoscopy. And uh, it's important to have a multidisciplinary team for patients that experience a, a vaginal prolapse or have urinary symptoms, have a urogynecological evaluation before planning uh, to fix just one compartment or addressing just the bowel issue in an isolated fashion. Um, there's a little of uh, controversy about whether it's important to test the uh, physiology with the anorectal manometry. This usually doesn't end up changing much in the treatment of this patient. It's also uh, when the prolapse is present, it's really hard to get a good manometry. Um, most of my patients, I tell them that um, I anticipate having them having some degree of pelvic floor dysfunction, and it's probably better assessed after the um, treatment uh, is done. And I also prepare them to the idea of committing to some degree of felt pelvic of some cycles of pelvic floor physical therapy after uh, surgical correction. Uh, the importance of imaging, um, if the rectal prolapse is evident and the patient has no associated symptom, uh, either uh, from a GYN or a urologic standpoint, that might uh, be avoided. But if the patient has isolated symptoms, a defecography is very helpful in uh, assessing the other compartments. Um, I, I don't think that MRI defecography and X-ray defecography are mutually exclusive. I think they're very complementary. and. I really try to figure out what I'm trying to gather from the test when I make the decision between which one I want to get. Um, MRI defecography is done in non-very physiologic condition, and it has a very good quality in assessing all the compartments and the muscle. So that's when I uh, usually get the MRI. If I want to see exactly the relationship between the organs, I'm trying to figure out if there is an issue with the anterior compartments as well. If I'm trying to, if I'm debating whether the patient actually has an internal prolapse or degree of intussusception, and uh, I actually prefer to do a more physiologic exam, which is for the echography on a radiolucent commode, which would reproduce the condition in which the patient normally defecate. These are some, uh, this is a floral defecography. You can see here the intussusception. You can kind of see how the bowel is actually falling into itself and the conscious is sitting up, uh, up here and it's kind of creating a valve mechanism. And here it's a very striking picture of a rectocele, rectocele that will not empty. So the patient is pushing, the rectocele fills up, the top part will fill down in the rectum, but this portion is, remains full. Um, I didn't spend too much time focusing on the rectocele. We can talk about management of rectocele at the end if somebody has some question. Uh, it's often associated, but it's a slightly different flavor. And again, I can give you uh, my take on that at the end if somebody is interested. Um, Non-operative treatment is a temporizing measure. Um, patients are instructed to try and reduce the prolapse. Um, it's mostly for symptomatic relief. They are educated about uh, how to prevent acute uh, complication from it. 
uh, when patient will present with an incarcerated prolapse uh, of the bowel will be all swollen, coating it with table sugar will reduce the, anima, the, the edema and then it will allow to generally reduce it. Of course, this doesn't treat the problem, but temporizes it uh, for an elective repair. It was doing an emergent uh, perineal prophectomy uh, might be quite challenging and it has its own issue. And as I mentioned before, biofeedback preoperatively um, doesn't have a big role. It would be hard for this patient to go through it, but I always tell them upfront that I would like them at least to be evaluated and see if there is an opportunity to improve their uh, pelvic floor function after a repair. So uh, surgery is the only way to cure the problem in a definitive way. Um, all sorts of procedures have been described in the past with different approaches. Uh, the big uh, debate over time has always been going through the abdomen versus going through the perineum. Um, it's still kind of unsure what the best way of going about it, although through the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you my take on what I think the best approach is to date. It's always uh, been thought that um, the recurrence, uh, recurrence after perineal approaches are greater than uh, uh, a repair done through an abdominal approach, but a very elegant trial, the Prosper, uh, Prosper trial that was done in 2013, that was published in 2013, uh, they had, this had four arms. Two arms were comparing an abdominal approach, two arms were comparing a perianal approach. Um, overall, rectal prolapse, uh, since they were really following close in this patient, it turned out that rectal prolapse uh, uh, recurrences are actually a little bit higher than everybody thought. And uh, when they compare the approaches, actually no statistically significant difference was noted. First of all, in Altmaier versus Adelorum, and I'll show you what these are, most of you know, but we'll go over it for a moment. When comparing resection versus suture rectal axis, which could have been done either laparoscopic or open, um, the difference also were not significant. And when comparing all together perianal versus abdominal approaches, again, no significant difference in the recurrence rates. So just to uh, kind of revisit what we're talking about, the oldest procedure has been described to treat this problem. It's kind of barbaric, um, and it kind of entails just putting something around the anus to prevent uh, uh, the rectum to fall out, three uh, procedure. Uh, this can be done either with uh, a thick suture or a little strip of mesh material that is tunneled around the anus and tied to, it, to itself. It really doesn't fix the problem, it just prevents uh, from things to fall out. Um, recurrence rate eventually are high, uh, but this can really create, because since this band of tissue will not stretch out, um, it can create massive problems in terms of obstructive symptoms. This is pretty much abandoned. The only case, I've never seen one done, the only case where the, uh, there is consensus that it could still be used is in patients that have uh, had it that went already uh, to a diversion to just symptomatically prevent the rectum from, from falling out. Um, but uh, again, this is more of a historical value. The Lorne procedure uh, is uh, a repair that doesn't involve all the layers of the rectum. Basically, uh, the patient is placed either, either in the prone or in the um, lithotomy position. The prolapse is averted as much as possible. Then an incision is made, is made uh, uh, one centimeter distal um, uh, to the dentate line. And then the mucosa is stripped off, the, off of the muscularis layer. And then a series of suture is placed um, sequentially along the muscular tube. And then the mucosa is tied to itself. And this is kind of the final result. So the mucosa, the uh, muscularis layer is bunched onto itself and, uh, uh, and then a, a mucosal anastomosis is achieved at the end. Uh, the Altmaier procedure is instead a full thickness type of repair. It's a, a rectal sigmoid resection uh, that is performed through the perineum. At the beginning of the case, the prolapse is everted as much as possible and a full thickness incision is made just uh, about one or two and a half centimeters distal to the dentate line. Uh, then uh, uh, the uh, full thickness of the bowel uh, is incised. And uh, once that's done circumferentially, 
um, and uh, the abdomen is centered, then the mesentery of the sigmoid colon is identified and divided. Uh, the sigmoid colon is pulled out until it feels taut, uh, meaning that uh, the full extent of the sigmoid colon is excised. And then uh, the mesentery of the sigmoid is uh, divided close to the bowel. Once enough length of the bowel has uh, been uh, uh, dissected, the bowel is transected. Usually at this time, most physicians will perform um, elevator plasty. Uh, it can be done either anterior or posterior. I don't think there is any evidence that one is better than the other. It's usually done with two, three uh, non-absorbable stitches to approximate and kind of bring the elevator muscle together and uh, minimize the defect. And then an anastomosis is performed uh, with interrupted suture. Uh, the other, uh, going through the, the abdominal approaches instead, uh, the, uh, when approaching this through the abdomen, what we are trying to achieve instead, instead of removing the rectum and uh, um, we can include a sigmoidectomy, we'll talk about it. But this approach instead focuses on fixing the rectum through a solid structure, which is the sacrum behind it to prevent uh, the prolapse. So in a transabdominal approach, the rectum is mobilized, um, is mobilized posteriorly and laterally on one side. And then uh, um, sutures are placed um, about the level of S1. Usually we recommend to touch the bone with the needle then slightly pull back to have a good bite of anterior sacral uh, ligament. And then this is suture to the muscularis of the rectum. Usually um, a couple of sutures are placed on each side of the midlines for a total of four. Everybody uses a slightly different technique. And uh, the American Center of Colorectal Surgery in the, practice, uh, in the current practice guidelines recommend that a sigmoid resection uh, is performed in association with the pexis in patients that have a known history of constipation, which as we saw is the majority of them. Patients that do not have a history of constipation do not benefit from uh, associating a sigmoid colectomy with this procedure. The most modern approaches to this problem instead are, uh, instead of simply suturing the rectum uh, to the sacrum, is to use a piece of mesh to kind of suspend the rectum and then the mesh is secured to the sacrum. There are at least three ways of doing this. It's the Ripstein procedure. It's a rectal encirclement. As you can see here, the rectum is pulled up and then a piece of mesh is wrapped around and is secured to the rectum and then the mesh itself is secured to the sacrum. Uh, this had a few issues by uh, which were mostly uh, involved in this being a little bit too tight. There are several modifications. Um, I've personally never seen this done, so I don't have direct experience with this, as well as with a posterior rectal encirclement um, uh, using the Ivalon sponge. Uh, it's something that I've seen described and I do not have direct experience with it. What uh, most people will do this day when an anterior approach uh, is performed is the um, ventral mesh rectopexy, or so-called door uh, procedure. This entails a dissection of the rectum. Usually the peritoneum is incised on the right uh, pararectal sulcus. And then the incision on the right side is curved towards the midline. The anterior sec septum is dissected almost all the way to the anal canal. And then a strip of mesh is secured with several, uh, several interrupted stitches uh, through to the anterior wall, wall of the rectum. I was actually trained that the first couple of stitches sh should actually uh, incorporate pelvic floor muscle at this level. And then uh, the uh, tail of the mesh is secure either with tacks or with a couple of suture in the same fashion that we have described to the sacrum around S1. And then the peritoneal reflection is closed anteriorly to separate the mesh, uh, to confine the mesh outside of the uh, abdominal cavity. 
The first result that were uh, reported by Dor in 2004, they described a series of 42 patients that had this procedure done laparoscopic. They didn't have any big uh, uh, complication postoperatively. Uh, they um, observed the recurrence in a two patients. And uh, the majority of the patient actually uh, had a significant improvement of, of their incontinence. And uh, almost all patients had resolution of symptoms of obstructive defecation. And only one patient uh, had a new onset of obstructive defecation. Uh, uh, sorry, two patients had new symptoms of, uh, of inability or increased difficulties on moving their bowels. Over time, this gained popularity, and uh, there are many, the literature is full of study comparing this and uh, the other approach. There are all sorts of permutation that you can imagine in comparing approaches have been done. And as well, uh, a lot of retrospective analysis has been done to try and piece together all the bulk of evidence that is present in the literature. This is the most recent retrospective, uh, the systematic review that I can find and includes 1,200 patients. Um, and this specifically looks at this procedure, laparosp uh, the laparoscopic ventral mesh rectal vaccine. The conversion to open surgery is about 2%. Complication rate overall uh, across the board was uh, 12%. Most, most of these are minor complications. The majority is like urinary retention. Recurrence rate was around 3%. Uh, the most dreaded uh, sequel of the surgery, some sort of mesh-related complication, which is reported around this incident across the studies in the literature, and I spend a little bit of time talking about it, is about 1%. 80% um, will have improvement of their fecal incontinence, 70% will have improvement of their constipation, and male patients, and uh, the length of the mesh used uh, actually were the only predictor of uh, recurrent, rectal, recurrent uh, rectal prolapse, which kind of tells you that technique matters in this case. Looking at comparison about laparoscopic ventral mesh versus a perianal procedure, again, there's a study that showed no difference, and looking at outcomes uh, between a laparoscopic suture rectopexis um, Posterior, with the posterior approach versus the anterior uh, ventral mesh rectopexy. Again, not a lot of difference. What we have learned is that uh, when we used to say that uh, patients uh, that have associated comorbidities should definitely uh, be considered uh, for a perianal approach because it's less morbid, uh, well, looking back, it looks like that uh, with the advent of laparoscopic surgery, actually that may not be uh, so true anymore because morbidity when comparing um, rectopexis versus perianal approach, I would say in modern medicine, the incidence of uh, the morbidity is not different between uh, laparoscopic um, anterior transdominal approaches and perianal approaches. The only additional morbidity looking at the literature seems to be when uh, a resection is added uh, to a rectopexy, and that's probably the morbidity related to the resection itself. What's also very true, and I, um, I, I, I actually experienced this on my skin, I haven't done that many laparoscopic procedures, um, a procedure like this with a laparoscopic approach. But the learning curve is pretty steep. Uh, it's not an easy procedure to do. Uh, it takes a long time and you start getting better about it uh, when you reach 50 cases. It takes 80 cases to uh, reach the recurrence rate where you are supposed to be. And in terms of complication, it's actually higher. You start seeing your complication going down after you uh, do about 90 cases. So it's not an easy procedure to learn and to do. What's the new toy uh, in the store? It's the robot. And of course, um, this technique now has been uh, uh, explored and performed with the robot. The first series uh, of uh, uh, ventral mesh rectopexy performed robotically came out of UC Irvine, the group of Dr. Pigazzi. Uh, they uh, reported on 24 patients uh, with a mean operative time still 
took them about three hours to stay in the hospital for about three days. Nobody needed to be converted. Um, nobody had like, any complication or mortality. The results are pretty good. Um, they have incontinence, uh, good results in terms of incontinence and constipation. And one had worsening symptoms compared to preoperative uh, to the preoperative assessment. This gained popularity again, and now uh, there are studies looking back and see whether the robotic approach is actually uh, objectively better compared uh, to the laparoscopic approach. Um, when reviewing what's out in the literature, um, this is a, a match first study. And uh, as you can see, uh, the distribution of the cases was the same. There's actually not a whole lot of difference. If, either, uh, even when you look at operative time, hospital stay, and uh, uh, subjective uh, improvement uh, reported by the patient. The only thing that uh, stood out uh, in this case is that robotics, uh, the robotic approach took longer. I uh, believe that this was related mostly to the initial stage of the experience reported. And uh, because especially if you're not, if your institution doesn't support in a certain way, the docking of the robot sometimes uh, can take a lot of time. Uh, so that has usually a lot to do with the efficiency of the operative room altogether rather than with the procedure itself. But short of that, the results are actually um, reproducible. And then this is an actual uh, a further uh, study that was done in uh, uh, Great Britain. Uh, it's a randomized control trial, which show actually that there is no difference, not even in operative time uh, between the robot and the laparoscopic approach. The last uh, thing that I, will, that I wanna spend some time on is what, from a strictly technical standpoint, um, what should we use uh, in terms of mesh if we had towards uh, adopting this procedure. This was classically done with the uh, polypropylene mesh. Uh, most people went from heavy meshes to lightweight meshes. And uh, as I showed previously, uh, if you look across the board in the literature, mesh erosions are reported around 1%. And that's honestly what I quote to my patient that, you know, uh, there's a lot of publicity, especially in the United States about mesh complication. There are big lawsuits on TV when you say mesh. Patients jump off the chair, oh, you want to put a piece of mesh in me, what's going to happen? Uh, so I quote, uh, if I elect uh, a um, non-absorbable mesh, I'll tell them that uh, chances of erosion are around 1%. Um, this is a systematic review of the literature um, that is comparing the use of uh, synthetic versus biological mesh. And uh, this specific review showed no difference in time of recurrence or complication. And you can see that uh, the rates are below 1%. There is something that came out a little more recently. Um, it includes some of the same study and something newer uh, that showed actually that biological mesh should, uh, seems to have a lower rate of erosion, a drop from 1.9 to 0 0.2. Um, all of these patients didn't have, didn't experience any cat catastrophic complications, but uh, this is something that I actually came across very recently, and I haven't acted on it in terms of uh, changing my uh, behaviors, but it's something probably to keep in mind. And lastly, because again, everything can potentially matter, uh, it also be looked at what type of sutures are used to uh, secure the mesh uh, to uh, the rectum. Normally what I've seen, uh, the people I train with and what I've been doing, I use Tycron or Ethibon is the same thing. Uh, it's a non-absorbable braided suture. Uh, the beauty of it, it ties really well. You can actually control the tension on the suture. Uh, it doesn't unravel. Uh, it really gives you a good feeling when you're suturing, especially robotically, because you can see how much tension you're putting on the suture. But that compared to something reabsorbable like uh, PBS, there is a slowly reabsorbable monofilament suture. Uh, and this is small numbers, um, but it, in this study, they show a significant difference in mesh erosions. Actually, they saw no erosion when they use PBS. 
In terms of mesh in this study, they use uh, a non-reabsorbable non synthetic polypropylene mesh. Uh, the only difference was the suture that was employed for tachinids the rectum, and they noticed a significant decrease in the mesh erosion complication uh, in the patient that uh, were treated with the PBS suture. So um, some takeaway messages, uh, surgery is the only real treatment for patient with over rectal prolapse. Um, there is still debate about which approach is best. Current trends across the literature and when you go to conferences and when you train and when you see what's offered, I don't know if yet supported uh, by the data, but it seems to favor abdominal approaches pretty much for all age groups unless the patient is very infirm, then you can only perform a procedure under local anesthesia. Personally, I do believe it's a more uh, physiologic operation. Uh, the rectum has a function. Uh, the rectum, especially in patients that have impaired ability to control their stool, having a reservoir rather than having basically a straight tube of colon attached to their anus, I cannot imagine not having some sort of implications. And that's why I think most physicians are shifting towards reserving perianal approaches in uh, um, limited conditions and then in some revisional cases, and we can talk more about it. Uh, but I think that across the board, a transabdominal approach is favored. It's important to talk to the patient and let them know that certain things can get better, certain things might not, certain things can get worse. Um, incontinence, usually it gets better, but um, especially if their bowel function is not perfect, uh, they might not gain complete continence. And it's important to tell this, tell this upfront because they might end up being very disappointed. And that's why I tell them in the beginning, if your incontinence is not entirely related to the prolapse, but it's related to a component of pudendal neuropathy, and the uh, atrophy of the sphincter and pelvic floor relaxation. That's why I prepare them up front to go through uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, which would, could give them their extra gain to bring them to an acceptable bowel function without the need for a colostomy. Constipation is kind of across the board. Um, I don't know what to tell them if they have a strong history of constipation and I'll do a sigmoid colectomy. Uh, with the rectopexy, I expect them to get better. If I just do a rectopexy and they had some, some degree of constipation, I, it's usually uh, almost the flip of the coin. And then it's important to have a multidisciplinary team. And again, we can talk more about it. The advantage of the transabdominal approaches is also that you can treat multiple compartments at once. Doing a perineal, a perineal protectomy doesn't allow you uh, to address um, the uterus, the vagina, a possible uh, uh, prolapse of the anterior compartment. While uh, doing uh, um, eventual mesh rectopexy, uh, along with a urogynecologist, can actually uh, allow them to use the same mesh to kind of suspend the anterior compartment to it. And that's my last point. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Questions? Professor Lacerda. Thank you, Zocali. Dr. Lacerda will, is, is moderating the session. Wonderful. Okay. Boa noite a todos. Good evening, Dr. Marcos Zocali. Uh, in attention to our special guests, I will speak in English most of the time. First of all, I'd like to thank Magda and our society for the kind invitation to discuss some points of this very comprehensive lecture about rectal prolapse. As we've seen, the large range of surgical techniques described to correct the rectal prolapse reflects the lack of consensus regarding the best operation. By the way, a recent review of our randomized control trials of surgery to date for managing rectal prolapse, found that the heterogeneity of objectives, interventions, and outcomes makes analysis very difficult. Moreover, there were insufficient data across 15 randomized control trials involving over 1,000 patients 
to say which of the abdominal or perineal approach is most effective. Dr. Zocali, as you mentioned, laparoscopic ventral rectopexy is not an easy procedure, usually demanding a long learn curve or more than 50 cases. I consider the surgery one of the best indications for robot approach. But I like to know about the experience and results in general with ventral rectopexy in male patients, since it's not easy to perform the dissection in the rectovesical space. Do you think that risks of genital renal dysfunctions should be a big concern in this case? So first of all, I do not offer this procedure laparoscopically. I don't think I have adequate uh, training to do that. Um, I've only seen it done by one of the physician in my fellowship. He used to do it because he was not robotically trained. I don't think that the visualization is adequate. I don't think that I can actually get low enough to expose the pelvic floor and uh, place the stitches where I really want them to land. And especially male patients, as you were suggesting, were violating the prostate. That's a territory where you can create some incredible complication. You can get into the urethra, you can get into the prostate, you can injure a seminal vesicle, you can injure the nerve, retrograde ejaculation. So I do believe that this is actually, uh, I use the robot very selectively, um, a little bit for beliefs, training, and resources. I don't have the luxury to do my appendectomies robotically. So I really need to pick and choose. And if I have to choose one operation that I do beside a very low rectal cancer, it's probably this one. Because I don't need a robot to get under the iliocolic pedicle. I can do that. The laparoscopy works just fine. But the fine dissection and actually being able to see every single fiber that I'm cutting through, it actually gives me that level of uh, security. I don't have enough personal experience on male patients. We see them very rarely. Uh, probably we've done one or two of these in male patients in training. Um, I don't know if there is any specific data, but once again, if I'll have to do it, um, when I have to do it, it's definitely a robotic approach. Um, and the other thing is uh, the posterior dissection, uh, in my, not in my opinion, but um, that should be kept to a minimum. So uh, first of all, there is no reason to uh, take a chance of injuring the, uh, the nerves posteriorly. Uh, second, dividing uh, the stalks should be avoided. So the posterior dissection should be done uh, um, enough to the point to expose the amount of sacrum that you uh, need to see to tuck the mesh. Then you come on the side, on the sulcus, and you just dissect that. And then you get on the pouch of Douglas and you incise the perineal re uh, reflect, the peritoneal reflection. And that's when you want to go really, really deep until you see that the rectum cones down towards the a sphincter, and you start seeing the pelvic floor. You actually see the levator muscle, and you can almost, when you look with the robot, you can see they contract when you apply energy. That's where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And the, the mesh, the first couple of stitches on the mesh, they actually incorporate a little bit of the, the muscle to kind of lift up the pelvic floor mm -hmm. by pulling traction on the mesh. And then the subsequent, I usually do at least three or four rows of stitches along the rectum. The, with the robot, I actually can see how deep I'm going in the rectum. I think that most of these erosions are actually stitches that went too deep. The other thing that I do, I always do an endoscopy at the end of the case. I want to make sure that I didn't violate the, the, the rectum, that my stitches are not too deep, that I don't have a big hematoma. I want to make sure that when I do my flex sig internally, it looks pristine. And then pull back on the mesh. That's the thing that I second guess most in my practice. I never know how much is enough. Um, and I, that's what I try to gather based on what I've been trained and taught to do. And that's one of the reasons why still I still use in the lightweight polypropylene mesh because that's what I've done in my training and I've seen used the most and I have the best sense of what level of tension I'm achieving. I don't have enough experience with the uh, um, biologic mesh to get that feel of how much tension I'm doing. Also, I pull the mesh with a 
laparoscopic instrument first. I, I, I feel the tension with the laparoscopic instrument and get an idea how much mesh I should have and which spot should be tacked to the sacrum. And then on the robot, I'll do the stitching. And, and, and how do you fix the mesh to the sacrum? With stitch or with a tucker? How is your preference? Stitches. Stitches, only stitches? Yeah. Only stitches. Yeah. The, the, the angle is weird. You can do it with the tacker. The angle is kind of mm -hmm. weird. I can't really tell what I'm, how deep I am. Um, I've always done it with, it, it works fine. I mean, I have no data to support it. Um, again, my training was with sutures. They work just fine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And if I can expose enough, I know the spot where I am, there should be no veins really. Um, I expose that part of the sacrum that I can see the ligament. And uh, I watch the needle going in, lifting a little bit on the daughter. Um, Hyman, who I train, my train with, we only did it open with him, but he, he always told me, you should be able to lift the patient off the table with that stitch. It has to be a good butt. So you should have the feeling that the patient could be lifted off the <laughs> table with that. Uh, do you have any questions from the audience? Uh, and I'd like to ask you, how, how to avoid the nerves when fix the, the mesh uh, at the sacrum. Because you and the tip. Because with the with the robot, you can actually kind of see them. Uh, I go immediately lateral to the midline and uh, about at the level of S one, and I try to see the. Uh, you can most of the time you can see the nerves if you're in the right plane. You can see them, and I make sure that I see ligament instead, more whitish rather than the the nerves that you can see coming down. And I try to stay again, kind of close to the midline, slightly to the side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Zocali, sigmoid resection in conjunction with rectopexy is rarely performed here in Brazil, as well as in Europe. I'd like to raise some questions concerning this. Beyond constipation, which other criteria do you use to indicate this kind of surgery? And do you have any concern about using mesh when you perform a sigmoidectomy? And at last, have you ever had to extract the mesh in cases of pelvic infection due to complications related to the sigmoid resection? So um, the, the criteria used are usually based on the patient's history. Um, if they are, for example, on a new gen, if the patient has been taking lenses for a couple of years, if they have uh, been on multiple laxatives for many years, and they still report hard stool despite all the effort, and have been going through all uh, uh, the usual measure that we say, in fiber supplements, um, and uh, several attempted regimen. When I do the sigmoid resection, I do not put a match. That's the only mm -hmm. case that I will do a posterior rectal axis just with stitches. First mm -hmm. of all, I, which is not something, uh, I think that removing the, re the redundant sigmoid, it actually helps a little bit holding the rectum up eventually. Uh, despite, I don't want to have tension on the anastomosis, of course, and that's why the rectum gets tucked with at least four stitches on each side of the midline. Do a little bit of the section posteriorly. There is no need to go very low or lateral in that case. The rectum is mobilized to the side, it's pulled up, four stitches are placed. The, the stitch on the sacrum is the same that you would do to fix the mesh. The stitch anteriorly, it's a big uh, muscular bite on the rectum, and that's secured that way. I've okay. personally never seen um, a complication, thank God, and I probably <laughs> not say that publicly, uh, but it's been reported. And if uh, and that's the advantage of a um, biological mesh instead of a prosthetic mesh. Um, erosions are very dreaded procedure, a uh, very dreaded complication. Most of the time this will be managed with a diversion and that if the mesh needs to be removed, the rectum is primarily repaired, and then uh, you know make sure that the rectum is healed properly, uh, do a contrast study, make sure they haven't developed a fissure, and then reverse the colostomy. It's mm -hmm. it's scary. Um, yeah. 
like every patient that comes in with a benign condition and we're trying to make their quality of life better and then they end up with something such as a, like a fistula and that's why the start procedure is being abandoned but it will fix everything it will fix all type of prolapse the stable uh, uh, procedure but then even if you have i don't know one uh, uh iatrogenic uh rectovaginal fistula is too many yeah in a for treatment of a hemorrhoid sure, sure. and yeah. that's why that's also i didn't even describe mm -hmm. it because it's considered i think nobody does it anymore, does it anymore. yeah okay uh i have uh fabio Gontijo. do you want to ask your question that's <laughs> it Uh, nós ganhamos algumas perguntas aqui do uhum. chat. É, você gostaria que eu já passasse para o doutor? Sim, sim. Ah, ok. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Zocali for giving us your time and expertise. Um, doutora Kantia wants to congratulate you for the excellent presentation. And she also wants to know what kind of mesh does Dr. Zocali uses and how Uh, he prepared the mesh for uh, uh, yeah. in inserting on the patient. So um, thank you for the compliment. It's really my pleasure to do this with you guys. Um, I use a lightweight polypropylene mesh, um, which I cut. Um, do you know how uh, the, in the uh, wood oven pizza place they, they used to kind of pick up the pizza? It's just like like that shape, I do four by four, and then I taper down to two, and then I create a long strip, two centimeters uh, in width, and I leave it as long as the mesh is. And then I pull it inside through the pore. So the part that goes on the rectum is four centimeter broad, four centimeter long, and then it tapers down by one centimeter on each side and the rest is one centimeter long. The four by four part is fixed to the first, the most distal two stitches will incorporate a little bit of pelvic floor muscle and the rectum itself. And then I'll do two rows, uh, three rows on each side of the midline of the stitches taking a couple of fibers of the mesh and uh, about a half a centimeter by I do more stitches and I prefer them to be a little more shallow rather than taking big stitches and taking any chance of going too deep. Those stitches are not what eventually are going to hold the mesh. The mesh is going to scar to the rectum. I, we just need it in place for a few days until everything scars down. Then again, I take a feel laparoscopically because I need to feel the tension and make sure I have just enough that I don't know if I do it right and I don't know how to describe it. And then I will, once I get a sense of how much mesh do I need to reach the right spot on the sacrum, also accounting a little bit because eventually the peritoneal reflection will be closed on top of the mesh, which will create a little bit of distortion of the mesh and will add some tension to it because the mesh, when you try and tense it, is going straight, but eventually the peritoneal closure is going to force it to kind of turn around. So the distance, the length of the mesh will increase because it's shift to the, to the right, and it will provide a little more traction on the rectum. And then I'll do uh, two or three stitches on the sacrum. I extract the excess mesh, mesh that I don't need, And then I just run a vicral suture all along the peritoneal reflection. And when you see it, it's like, how's this gonna, ever going to work? And then once you start at the apex, forget what's happening on the right side. Start from the left and take one stitch at a time and make sure you make the same progress on both sides. Eventually, it's going to magically close and the mesh is going to disappear under the, perit the peritoneal reflection. Tem mais alguma pergunta, Fábio, da audiência? Yeah, I, I have two more questions myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Zakali, if, if the patient is being operated on for the first time, you're always going to use a mesh or sometimes going to just fix the rectum. 
And the other question is if you have any experience using glue to fix the mesh, and if you see any role for it, uh, even when using robots, because the stitch would be easier using robots. Let's start with the last one. The glue on the rectal side or on the sacrum side? On which part? The rectal. Uh, on the mesh, on the rectum. I would not trust it um, uh, because the, the mesh kind of, the, the glue, the only time that I've used it in the past would be for uh, hernias. I would put two uh, when I would do laparoscopic hernias. But in those cases, you have much big surface to do friction. I don't know if I would trust it. Um, I've never seen anybody using it. It might just work as well. It's not part of my practice. I have no experience with it. Um, I would rather stitch it if I'm, because I know there is going to be tension on that. Uh, and I don't know how the glue is going to behave and how quickly it's going to, uh, you know, attach the mesh to the rectum. So could be interesting. I personally wouldn't trust it. I can imagine maybe using less stitches and put a little bit of glue. Uh, the problem is usually not at that level. Usually when this fails, it's something good happening. Either the, the length of the mesh is not right or is not attached properly to the rectum. It might make it a little bit quicker, but once you get a little bit of dexterity on the robot, it's like 15, 20 minutes to stitch it. I trust it more. So I don't know if I would do that. Um, the few patients that will undergo a colectomy with it, as I was saying, I will not put a mesh. I'll just do a posterior fixation. That doesn't burn any bridge. If they prolapse again after the anastomosis is healed, you can bring them back and do a ventral mesh rectopexy, kind of start fresh. That's why also the first time around when you do that, don't do too much dissection. So uh, you need to be really uh, cautious. And uh, if they don't have uh, like really terrible history of constipation, they really have to convince me that they are horribly constipated and nothing works for them, then I'll just do with the rectopexy. Also, you know, if I think that it's an outlet type constipation, if it's the problem with the outlet related to the um, prolapse itself, of course, I'm not going to give them a sigmoidectomy. If they're telling me my stool is soft, I take uh, milk and magnesia twice a day just wouldn't come out. That's not slow transit constipation. I try to not gauge the problem. If they're telling me, I've been taking this, I've been taking that, my stomach is always full. I got an x-ray, my cecum was still, was still full of stool all throughout. If you have any doubt, you can also do a transit study. You can do a SIDS marker study. Uh, it's hard to find SIDS mark now, but you can use PILCAM to do a motility study. There are also sorts of things to kind of assess motility if you are on the fence, whether you should actually associate a resection. But I want to be convinced that I have to do it. Otherwise, I'll just uh, do a ventral mesh rectopexy. That's kind of my go-to operation. Dr. Zokal, when, when we have a recurrence after a perineal procedure, we proceed to an abdominal rectopexy. But what we should we do after a rectopexy recurrence? a sigmoidectomy, trying to refix the mesh. What's your view? See what the problem is. See what went wrong. If it's an early technical recurrence, it's uh, sometimes dissecting that plane is going to be really hard. Sometimes you can just, if the mesh is still secure to the sacrum and you can see that the mesh is kind of loose to the, uh, is secure to the rectum and has been, is released from the sacrum, you can try and reuse the same mesh and reattach it if the dissection is not too hard. I would not try really hard to redissect that plane, that's for sure. In those cases, also a perianal approach might be difficult because trying to get anteriorly for a full thickness resection might not be easy. There might be a role, it depends on the degree of prolapse. If you're dealing with a big prolapse, probably do a transabdominal approach. I try to dissect posteriorly and try to just fix the rectum. If the mesh is attached anteriorly, uh, try and reuse the same mesh and retack it to the rectum in a into the sacrum in a different spot. Or if it's a mild prolapse, then you can try something at the lorem procedure, something non full thickness, because getting into that for, is, for a small one, for a small for one, a small one, small, you might yes. try that, which might mm -hmm. actually work. 
Yes. Uh, in general, for recurrences, be mindful what has been done before. You guys know, but you know, for the trainees, uh, make sure that you are resecting your anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Whatever you are doing, you are redoing a perianal approach. If you leave few segment, uh, the segment between two separate anastomoses is by definition the vascular lines is going to necrosis. So if they had an Altmaier and you redo an Altmaier, you can do it as many times as you want. Once you get to the end, it's going to be really hard. But every time you have to be 100% sure that you are resecting the previous anastomosis. Otherwise, you're leaving a, an ischemic, seg ischemic segment of, of bile. OK. I think our time, our time is over. I will return to Dr. Magda and Dr. Bruno Venek uh, to make their final comments and acknowledgment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Zocali, for your brilliant presentation. And I hope see you soon. <laughs> I hope so. I hope this was helpful. Uh, it was a real pleasure meeting you virtually. Hopefully, I'll see you at one real meeting if they're going to ever happen again. Um, yeah. <laughs> really a lot of fun. It was a privilege. I hope I could actually give you a little bit of insight on, on this topic. <laughs> thank, thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank Dr. you Bruno. so much. Dr. Zoc Zocali and Bruno, would you... Dr. Zocali, thank you so much for the brilliant presentation. It was great for us here. Uh, eu gostaria de agradecer a Magda Lacerda também pela presença, por todo o esforço, o doutor Fábio Gontif. É, sabe, explicar para vocês que nós temos essa aula já disponível no YouTube, a partir de amanhã. Então, é, siga no nosso canal, é, compartilhe e se inscreva, porque aí você vai, vocês vão poder ser avisados toda vez que tiver. Nosso canal chama SMCP Coloproctologia. E também gostaria de convidar para a próxima aula da SMCP Virtual, que vai ser daqui a duas semanas, com o doutor Antônio Hilário, doutor em cirurgia e membro titular da Sociedade Brasileira de Coloproctologia. Vai ser moderado pelo doutor Hélio Antônio Silva, diretor de TI da Sociedade Mineira de Coloprocto e membro titular da Sociedade Brasileira de Coloproctologia. Nós vamos discutir um pouco sobre a ASCO 2020, é, sobre a, T, a TNT a indução ou consolidação de uma nova estratégia no tratamento do câncer de reto. Vocês todos vão ser muito bem-vindos e eu conto com vocês. Um grande abraço e até daqui a duas semanas. Bye, Dr. Zocali. Bye, bye. bye for everyone in Colombia. Thank you, Dr. Zocali. Thank you. It's a pleasure for us. My pleasure. My privilege. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.